Judicial yes. Center um, and the League of Women Voters meeting. Uh, I'm Anne Marie McClellan, and I am one of the vice presidents for the League of Women Voters. Um, Marky Hageman here is our president of the League, and Alan Archer is another vice president with the League. Um, there's many League members around here, um, and they will, you'll see them. Closer, they're having trouble here. Oh, is this, oh, that's too good. Huh? <laughs> um, I have a number of announcements. This um, is not a formal business meeting. This is a, one of our educational forums. Um, however, we would like to bring to your attention these ladies at this table right here. These are the voter registration um, group that for our voter vet registration committee and they are selling these signs that say vote and so we're having a little fundraiser for the signage that's adopt a sign for twelve dollars you can adopt the sign and it will be yours forever to put out to remind people to vote and we have stickers that update it every um, twice a year with the days of the voting so we will provide you stickers as you go along um, so if you'd like to participate in that just see the ladies at the table at some point after the meeting um, the other thing we'd like to talk about is to uh, let you know that we do have memberships to the League of Women Voters um, for half year, so it's a special price if you're interested in joining the League. Also, um, see the ladies at the table and you can get our discount rates. And we would like to have everyone know that the League of Women Voters, although it was founded 100 years ago for help to educate women who had just gotten the right to vote, Men are very welcome, and um, we are pleased that there are two members of the League of Women Voters that are participating in our panel today, or leading our panel. Um, so check that out. Uh, we would also like to remind everyone of the school board forum um, that will be held here on March 7th. So if you're interested in hearing about the people that are running for school board, come in at 6.30 and we'll be uh, asking some questions and getting to know them better before we go out and vote. Uh, lastly is a reminder um, of the Red Cedar Watershed Conference um, at Stout on March 14th. I imagine most of us here are interested in water and that's why we're here, so you might know about this. But if you don't, um, it's really a great session um, and everyone is encouraged to go and it's a great learning opportunity. And there's some flyers over here on the table. Yeah, and, yeah, and there's flyers for that over there. Um, you do have to register to go, but I think you can register at the door on the 14th. Um, so this um, forum is sponsored by the Environmental Study Group. And the League of Women Voters have a number of study groups and this study group is chaired by Greg Miller right here, who's a member of the League. And um, it is um, being organized here and led by Mark Leach, who is also a member of the League and a member of the Environmental Study Group. So I'm going to just turn it over to Mark to do the introductions of the speakers. And um, thank you all for coming. And we look forward to learning a lot. Thank you, Anne-Marie. The one thing I always worry about for presentations is the technology. <laughs> and so, if I go this way. Okay, so can everyone hear me all right? Yes. So the League is, what is it, 99 years old, 100 years old this year? And our environmental study group is less than a year old. And we begin, um, for reasons I'm not even sure, with an interest in this uh, uh, septage spreading on land. Uh, the county board, some of the county board members were interested in this. I'm a scientist, I study complex systems, and I confess, I really don't know much about septic spreading or the issues surrounding it. So, uh, none, and none of the members of our committee actually knew a whole lot about it. And so, what we want to do this evening is uh, present you informationally uh, kind of what we've been learning about uh, septic spreading 
And um, so I invite you to listen. We have a series of speakers that we've been learning from. Uh, afterwards, we'll have a discussion. And one of the things our committee and the league is particularly interested in is what do we do with this information? We don't have a policy statement. Our committee is not recommending any policy statement about septic spreading. We're trying to find out whether this is an issue that we really should be concerned about or there's bigger problems that we should be dealing with. So I invite you all to participate in that after the presentations. We're going to have four speakers. I've asked them to all be very brief. Somebody once, much more clever than I am, once told me that the secret to giving a brief talk, well, there's two secrets to giving a brief talk. The first one is don't tell them everything you know. <laughs> so um, we already introduced, Henry introduced Greg Miller. You want to stand up just so people can see you? Greg is the chair of our environmental committee. Anne Maria is on it. Uh, Cheryl Miller is on it. Anybody else who? Uh, Marty. Anybody else here who wants to claim they're on the committee? <laughs> You're all welcome to to join us. So with uh, no further ado, let me uh, invite up Lindsay Olson, who's the uh, water quality specialist for Dunn County. Oh, I should have added that even though this, uh, we're concerned about uh, all the different counties around here, we have focused on Dunn County since that's where most of us live and we're most familiar uh, with the players. And I forgot to mention one other thing is that in no way do we want to uh, be pointing fingers at the plumbers and the sewage haulers or the farmers that uh, allow the sewage spreading on their land. We're just here to find out about these issues. And it's, I don't think of it as a system. It's not something that even if it is a problem that we want to be blaming people for it. And so uh, I just wanted to say that because I have a septic system and I am so happy that there's plumbers that understand it better than I do and can take care of it and and uh, deliver the poop somewhere for us. Anything else I should say? <laughs> Come on up, Lindsay. If you can hear me all right. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks, Mark, for inviting me to be here tonight. Um, as mentioned, my name is Lindsay Olson. I am the Water Quality Specialist at Dunn County, and I work in the Land and Water Conservation Division. Um, my position was actually created in 2015 in response to citizens coming to the county board and saying, we want more focus on water quality, groundwater, and surface water in Dunn County. Um, so it was a wonderful thing that the county board responded to those requests and um, created this position. Can, can you hear in the back? No. Okay, no, you're going to have to get well. <laughs> okay. I, can, I can turn it up a little more. Okay. So it sounds loud to me. It's so yeah, hard to know. Know. Tip it toward her mouth a little bit more. There. there. Yeah. How's that? Is that better? Getting some nods. Yes, okay. Uh, they're nodding, it's, it's better, so uh, if you can't hear me, just let me know um, and we'll try something else. Um, so groundwater is an essential resource here in Dunn County. Um, essentially all residents in the county receive their drinking water from groundwater and we're blessed here with an easy to access um, sandstone aquifer with wells averaging about 125 feet deep. Uh, more than half of Dunn County residents reside in unincorporated areas without service from a municipal well or a sanitary sewer system. The 2017 American Housing Survey 
which is conducted by the U.S. Census Bureau, uh, indicates that nationally only 11% of households derive their primary water source from individual uh, wells, and 18% use a private on-site wastewater treatment system or septic system. Uh, this puts Dunn County well above the national average. Uh, for private drinking water and sewerage systems, um, further emphasizing the need for uh, further emphasizing the importance of groundwater in Dunn County. Uh, because of its importance, it's crucial for us to understand the current status of our groundwater health and plan for uh, future protections. At the broadest sense, um, the primary source of groundwater concerns is humans. Uh, certainly, there can be uh, natural causes to groundwater contamination. Uh, but these are primarily the result of um, natural disasters, and they're usually isolated incidents, uh, not very common. Uh, groundwater concerns facing our community that have an impact on human health concerns um, include uh, elevated nitrate levels, um, can include bacteria presence such as E. coli and fecal coliform, uh, chemical contamination from industrial waste, uh, agricultural chemicals including herbicides and <coughs> pesticides, uh, heavy metals, arsenic, and pharmaceutical products. Uh, other groundwater concerns uh, may be more aesthetic, such as iron, which can cause staining, uh, pH, which can cause corrosion when it's too high, or scaling when it's too low. Uh, concerns that people have with septage spreading uh, may include transmission of pathogens, heavy metals, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, and contamination from those pharmaceutical and uh, personal care products. The EPA finds that human health risk for land application of septage or biosolids is considered low when the material is properly applied. Um, as with manure and manufactured agricultural chemicals, <coughs> applications, um, properly applied septage is uh, considered an environmentally sound method of disposal because it does add uh, nutrients and organic matter to the soil and improves plant growth, which is why we see it uh, applied to crop fields. Um, the rules governing septage spreading in Wisconsin um, and the practice and site selection are overseen by the Department of Natural Resources. And I was asked to speak to some of the health risks associated with contaminants that we might find in groundwater. Um, but before I do so, I want to be clear that um, I'm not aware of any documented contamination or reported illness in the county that can be traced directly back to uh, septage spreading. Uh, the health risks set out in describing are um, merely a summary of potential outcomes of groundwater contamination. Um, the contaminant that I know to be most common in Dunn County is uh, nitrogen, about 15% of our wells, based on the data that we currently have, um, exceeding the 10 part per million uh, safe drinking water level. Uh, this can be more in certain parts of the county or less. Um, it might be an isolated incident or it could be a, a regional uh, issue. Uh, nitrate is a human health concern because it can cause blue baby syndrome, which uh, restricts the flow of oxygen in the bloodstream uh, in infants and can lead to death. It's also important that um, pregnant women not consume water with uh, high nitrates in it. Um, there's also speculation that there may be other health concerns associated with long-term consumption of high nitrates by adults, um, but research is ongoing in that area. Um, nitrate is not treatable by chlorinating your water, and boiling your water will actually concentrate it more and, and make it um, worse. Uh, you can treat uh, high nitrate with um, a couple of methods, one of which is reverse osmosis if it's within a treatable range. And I don't have any source data here in Dunn County to confirm where, uh, the, when we do see high nitrates, what the source of those nitrates is. We haven't done any um, source uh, research or identification here. Um, the EPA says that the most common sources of nitrate contamination are fertilizer use, um, and I should maybe clarify that too, overuse of fertilizer, uh, leaking from septic, septic tank, tanks and sewage, and um, possibly erosion of natural deposits. Um, another contaminant would be microorganisms, such as bacteria, viruses, parasites, and these can cause uh, severe human health impacts. Um, and they come from human and fecal, uh, human and animal fecal waste primarily. Uh, consumption of water containing bacteria or uh, other microorganisms can cause gastrointestinal illness, and this can have complications arising in susceptible populations such as the immunocompromised um, older adults or uh, young children. 
health concerns surrounding um, agricultural herbicides and insecticides vary based on the specific chemical, but can, can include uh, liver and kidney damage, uh, endocrine and hormone problems, reproductive issues, uh, and certain cancers. Uh, our state Department of Ag Trade and Consumer Protection uh, has a Bureau of Agrochemical Management and they continually monitor groundwater throughout the state for the presence of agricultural chemicals. Um, they also periodically conduct uh, an intensive statewide uh, random sampling survey and these surveys test for the presence of, of um, agricultural chemicals and their metabolites. Um, there was uh, most recently a study put out in, in uh, 2017 that summarized the results of the most recent statewide survey. And you can find that um, by searching um, agricultural chemicals in Wisconsin groundwater. Pharmaceuticals and personal care products are another um, class of potential contaminants that can be present in groundwater. Uh, these products can include human and uh, animal drugs and medicine, dietary supplements, um, topical uh, products such as sunscreen and lotions, and then also cleaning products and other household chemicals. Um, the potential human health risks associated with the presence of these products in drinking water is uh, still being determined. And I do not know of any groundwater testing in Dunn County for um, pharmaceutical personal care products, uh, that, at least not that I have um, access to. So the big question is, um, where do we go from here with groundwater management? Uh, Dunn County uh, Board recently authorized the formation of a groundwater ad hoc committee. This committee includes uh, board members from the Health and Human Services Board and the Planning Resource and Development Committee, staff from um, Environmental Public Health, and then myself representing the Land and Water Conservation Division. And uh, we also have the City Wastewater Intendant, Paul Sturck, who's here with us tonight to speak. We also have a number of um, private business and citizens, including a uh, staff geologist from Cedar Corps, a well driller, uh, a farmer who's also a town board member, and a rural landowner. Uh, the meetings are open to the public, and you can find out when the next meeting is by looking at the Dunn County website at our public meetings calendar. Um, and we do have a brief public comment period at the beginning of those meetings, um, so you can uh, certainly join us if you would like to do that. Um, so I guess as I've mentioned, groundwater uh, is the life source of the residents here in Dunn County. So it is important to take a look at that and make sure that we're um, keeping it safe and um, drinkable with over half of our residents receiving their water from a private well and the remaining receiving their water still from groundwater through a municipal well source. Um, and I just want to say that I appreciate all of you being here tonight and thanks for your concern and I hope that you'll um, continue to campaign for clean drinking water. Thank you. So now that we've heard a little bit about what some of the threats are to our, our drinking water, um, I just want to set the stage a little bit for the rest of our speakers um, to let you know, in case you don't know, when uh, if you have a septic, uh, a septic system, it probably is required to be cleaned out every three years. And what happens with that material? There's basically two options. Uh, there are some other ones, but two main options. One is it could be taken to uh, a municipal wastewater treatment plant. The other option is with the, the land spreading, which is regulated by the DNR, and uh, we'll get a little bit more to the regulations uh, a bit later, other than to say you can read them all yourself. They are a bit complicated. Um, but. Let me invite up uh, Paul Sturk, who's the supervisor, is that the right title? Uh, superintendent. Superintendent, yeah. Superintendent of the Menominee Wastewater Treatment Facility. And let's see if I can do this
Okay, thanks Mark, thanks for having me here tonight. Um, the main topics I want to cover tonight um, are in general the wastewater treatment plant. I, I, some of you may not even know where it's at or exactly what we do, so I'm going to touch on a little bit of that. We do take in the septage from uh, holding septic tanks and a few other sources. I'm going to talk about that and, and what we charge and how that works. And I'd also like to talk about our sludge program because we do produce solids that end up on the, on the land as a fertilizer. So um, the Menominee Wastewater Plant, we're located next to the Red Cedar River. We serve the city of Menominee. So if you own a home, a business in the city of Menominee, you're tied into our sewer system. So anything that goes down your drain, your toilet, uh, showers, sinks, industrial waste, restaurant waste, uh, you name it, it comes down to the treatment plant. We get about one and a half million gallons per day. And I have just a real general overview here of the plant. Um, so we have our raw wastewater coming in. It gets screened, it gets pumped, it goes through a second screen, and then we go to grit removal. The material removed there goes to the landfill. So that would be rags, trash, garbage, all the things that you're not supposed to flush down your toilet, like flushable wipes, that kind of stuff gets taken out there, and then sand and grit. Uh, the water then flows around this way to the primary clarifiers where settling occurs. The material that settles in the primary clarifiers we call primary sludge, and that goes to the digesters. And then the liquid process goes this way, and we enter secondary treatment, which is a biological stage of treatment. I'm not going to go uh, into that too much because we just don't have the time, but we do produce biological solids here that get removed. Those also go to the digesters. So we have two sources of sludge going into our anaerobic digesters. These are heated at 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it's a mesophilic temperature range, and the detention time is about 40 to 45 days. Uh, we draw the sludge off daily, we thicken it, and we haul it by truck to a sludge storage facility um, out by Cardinal Glass on Badger Road. We have two million gallons of storage capacity. And then in the end, it gets land applied as a fertilizer. Now back to the water process. Once the water leaves the secondary treatment system, it gets chlorinated and dechlorinated and eventually goes to the Red Cedar River. Um, our design capacity, I get asked, you know, where are we at? What is our design? How much septage can we handle? These are our design capacities here, and this is where we're currently sitting at. So if you look at flow, we're designed for 2.88 million gallons per day, and we're receiving about 1.5, so we're at about 52% of our design capacity. Um, BOD, which is biochemical oxygen demand, it's a measure of the organic strength of the wastewater. We're designed to handle 7,760 pounds per day. We're currently at about 5,200 pounds per day or 67% of our design capacity. Our total suspended solids, about 47.40, and we're getting 49.90 a day, so we're actually a little over on our design capacity for total suspended solids. We're designed to handle 201 pounds per day of uh, total phosphorus. And our raw sewage has about 130 coming in, so we're at about 65% of our design capacity. Um, our biggest uh, concern, the DNR's main concerns, are the BOD and the flow. We are high on our solids, and um, it's not really causing us any issues. Uh, phosphorus, we've got some room as well. Uh, as I mentioned, we do take waste hauled in from uh, haulers, so here's the haulers. And uh, it might be kind of hard to see in the back, but the holding tank waste that we took in in 2018, about 4.3 million gallons trucked in. Septic tank, about 250,000 gallons. Uh, portable toilet waste, 5,400 gallons. And about 61,000 gallons of catch basin waste. Catch basin waste is floor drain waste from car washes, uh, implement dealers, auto shops, things like that. It can contain a lot of sand. And then our charges for the hauled in waste. Um, septic tank, we charge $114.12 per thousand gallons. Holding tank, $8.49 per thousand gallon. And portable toilet, $25 per thousand gallons. And 
the reason we have those charges is because septic tank and holding tank waste is considered a high strength waste. Uh, these are the values of the BOD, the solids, the phosphorus. As you can see, septic is pretty high. Holding tank is high. Um, domestic strength wastewater is much lower. And we charge a surcharge for these parameters, BOD, total suspended solids, and total phosphorus. So 45 cents a pound for BOD, uh, total suspended solids, 60 cents a pound, and $5.50 a pound for phosphorus. So a hauler brings in 1,000 gallons. I take these numbers, I plug them into my formula, and that's, that's what we charge. And for comparison, if you live in the city, um, a typical family of three would use about 2,500 cubic feet per quarter. Um, so they're going to pay about $84.50 a quarter, or about $338 a year or about $1,014 over a three-year period. Now that's just for the sewer portion of their water bill. Okay, um, how much more septic waste can we accept? We do take in quite a bit, as I mentioned. And uh, what I'm gonna <laughs> illustrate here is 90% of our design. We don't wanna be at 100% design. We want some, some wiggle rooms with some breathing room. Um, so if you look at, uh, at these different parameters here, when you look at how much more can we take, well, it depends what we're talking about. If, if you look at our design flow, I can take about 1,000, 1,000 gallon truckloads a day. Um, if we look at BOD, I can take about 30 1,000 gallon loads per day. If I'm gonna look at suspended solids, well, we're already over capacity, so if I look at that one, I would have to say none. And total phosphorus, we could take about 25 loads. That's assuming that our normal flow stays where it's at. Um, this is just where we're at now versus getting us to 90%. So I would say 25 to 30 would be a safe guess on how many, how many 1,000 gallon loads of septic tank we could take in a day. And then uh, the next question is, well, how many how many tanks are we talking about? Uh, are we just talking about Dunn County? Or are we talking about all these other counties? Because we get waste from all these places. They, they will bring it wherever is convenient or whatever is cheapest. So um, the number of tanks, the number of gallons, I would also need to have that information. And um, so, you know, where, where's it coming from? Which counties? Okay, back to uh, the wastewater plant, I mentioned the, the sludge, the biosolids. Um, we produce about two million gallons of uh, anaerobically digested sludge. Uh, it's a class B sludge or biosolids. Um, it's land applied in the spring and fall on uh, DNR approved sites. It's soil test uh, has to be done every three years. The application rate is based on nit nitrogen needs of the crop to be grown. Um, it's surface supplied and then it's incorporated by a contract hauler. It's regulated by NR204 of the uh, Wisconsin statutes, domestic sewage sludge management. And there is no charge to the farmer. If we have a farmer that's willing to accept it, we land apply it for free. And we do a, we hire a contract hauler. We pay about $40,000 a year for that hauler to land apply our sludge and just get in. Uh, this is a picture of our anaerobic sludge digesters at the plant. There's two of them. And then that's a picture of looking down at the top, there's a floating cover. And then this is our sludge truck that takes it from the wastewater plant to our sludge storage facility on Badger Road. That's a 3,500 gallon tanker. And we take out about 50 or 60 loads per month. And this is the storage facility. We have three of these harvest store tanks, about two million gallons of storage. And then uh, what other choices do we have with land application of sludge? Uh, we ran into some frozen ground in November a little bit. It was getting a little, a little close because we're not allowed to spread on the ground if it's frozen. We can't disc it in and incorporate it under the soil. Um, 
So I started making some calls in November. I did call the landfill in Eau Claire. They, they weren't even sure they would accept it. And if they did take it, he said it would probably be a, about a dollar per gallon. So that would cost the city about $200,000 per month to take it to a landfill. Another option is the biosolids facility in Ellsworth. This was built in 1996. There's several communities in west central Wisconsin that take their sludge there. They're part of a consortium. And we're not part of that consortium, but they would take our sludge, but they're gonna charge us $65,000 a month. Uh, they process it very similar to what we do, and they do land spread it as a fertilizer. The only difference is it would be spread in Pierce County rather than Dunn County. Um, incineration and hauling the ash to a landfill, we're not set up to do that. The only treatment plant I know of in the state of Wisconsin that does that is Green Bay, Green Bay Metropolitan Sewerage District, and they are looking to get away from that from what I've heard. There are uh, air permit, air pollution issues with doing that. And then uh, a final option, um, as I mentioned, we're a class B sludge. We're in the 90 degree, 90 to 100 degree temperature range. If we can get up into the class A sludge, which is 120 to 130 degree temperature range, and we dry that sludge and we get it nice and dry, then you can basically give it away. You can use it as a, you can use it for landscaping. You can put it on gardens. You've probably heard of malorganite. That's what Milwaukee does with it. We're not currently set up to do that, so there would be some capital costs, but of, of these four options, that's probably the best one if, if we can't continue to do what we do. And I think that's everything I had. Are there any questions, or are we doing questions later? We can take a couple of questions. Okay. You mentioned uh, the different counties. Yes. And you have like, you had certain percentages, 65%, 52%, 105%, you know, the different percentages. Mm -hmm. And some, so you, you had limits on how much you could take in or take out. My question is, with all those different counties, do you, do your eight counties or whatever that number was, do you work together to try and, like you say, you know, take it wherever it's cheapest? But it seems to me there's an obligation to process this responsibly amongst all counties. And I'm wondering how you work together to do that. Do you? Well, we have, we have the haulers that we work with. They're approved to bring us septage. Um, but we don't, we don't tell them where to bring it from. I mean, we, we take holding tank, we take, you know, we tell them what type of waste we take, they weigh it, they report, we charge them. But we haven't, we haven't put any limitations on it. We, you know, we haven't said, well, we, we, we won't take it from Barron County or Eau Claire County or Chippewa no, County. My question is, do, do you counties all work together to say, how are we as a network of eight counties capable of handling all these certain percentages that you are listed well, up here? Right. Well, I, I work for the city. I, I really can't speak for the county. I don't know if the county has has ever had that discussion or not. The question went back. If you talked about your digester, the mesophilic digester, yes. that doesn't get very hot. You know, what's what's the situation with the pathogens? You know, the you know, you talk about spreading and pathogens, you know, the pathogen. Yeah, it's it's ninety five degrees Fahrenheit, but the detention time of 40 to 45 days. There's pathogen reduction parameters that we have to meet in our permit, and that's satisfied by that temperature and time. Let, let me stop questions now, and because we have two more speakers, and we'll have time for more questions, so if you could save those, um, I'll okay. thank you, unless you have any final words no. to say. And then uh, I wanna invite uh, Bob Kolsenoff, who is the uh, the county <coughs> planning and zoning administrator, and he's going to talk a little bit about the uh, the legal aspects of this, the uh, the regulations NR one thirteen and NR one fourteen are. Uh, in a sense, uh, preemptive legislation 
so that it restricts the county from actually doing anything that's more restrictive than what the, the state allows. And so even if the county wanted to get involved in, in uh, changing how things were done, it, it would be difficult for the county to do it under these circumstances. But, uh, Bob, are you all set? I am. I'll turn it over. We're stealing all my thunder here. <laughs> So uh, I'll put this up here so I can kind of run my my little uh, computer here. So uh, thanks for having me. My name is Bob Colson. As I said, I am the uh, the Dunn County Zoning and uh, Administrator and the Planner. And I want to speak a little bit about uh, about septage and what the county has done, and maybe where where we are trying to go with it. Uh, in addition to what Lindsay spoke about, so. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background on NR 113, which is which are the state statutes that, that regulate this. And I'm, I am by no means uh, an expert on this, but so I'll give you just a little bit of, of things that we found out through our study on, on septic spreading. So NR 113, you know, it does does require a licensure for, for septic haulers to, uh, to, 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 to spread that stuff. Uh, there are some certain requirements that, uh, that need to be met. For example, uh, they can't be uh, on slopes any greater than 2%. Uh, they're applied at a rate of 10,000 gallons per acre or less. They're not allowed in, in wetlands. Uh, they're within 750 feet of any surface water uh, or wetland. They're not allowed in the floodplain. They cannot be spread on snow-covered or frozen ground, uh, except there are exceptions. And so uh, there are some systems on regular basis that are, that are maintained every six months and, and holding tanks that, that, that are accepted. Um, the application rates, there's a, bit, a little bit of talk about it. Uh, it's, it's really, it's applied on ag lands only, and, uh, and it can't be applied at rates which will, which will supply nitrogen greater than, than what the crop can, can take it up at. So, so there's a lot of calculations that go into that. Uh, the, the part that, that, that when we did a little study that, that we were a little disappointed is that we found that, uh, that uh, NR 113 does not allow the county to regulate septic spreadage any any uh, more restrictive than what what the statutes allow. So we can't apply any more any more regulations than what's already in place. Uh, the DNR is the one that that is that is uh, in charge of it. They have citation authority and they generally enforce that similar to the way that zoning enforces it. It's complaint driven. So um, so. Uh, we did, a, we did, and I'll show you a couple maps here at, near the end of the uh, presentation here, but we did a, we did a study where we, we developed a, a map of environmentally sensitive areas for the county. And then through the committee that I report to, they wanted to, they wanted to study uh, septage spreading uh, at that. And so, uh, so just a little bit about that, a little bit of background before we get into there. Uh, we found that according to DNR that there are 35 licensed uh, haulers in Dunn County. Uh, they they they're not required once once they get a site that uh, approved they're not required to let the DNR or anyone know which site they're using what day they're using but they can just use them so it makes it difficult you know for for us if we wanted to regulate or go and check on them to figure out just just where they're at uh, they do have to uh, report what they've done for the year at the end of the year uh, January thirty first uh, but it's self regulated. Uh, and according to the DNR, there are 493 approved septage spreading sites in the county, and those are just for those are just for for uh, for septage, not for the sludge and stuff that that uh, that, the, that the other ones uh, that are dealing with. Uh, and in an effort to uh, to locate uh, the actual sites, we requested some data from from the, from the from the state, and it's it's very difficult uh, to explain this, but but they they provide data. At, at the 40 level, and so, so we know which 40 it is, um, but, but for us to understand the actual site, uh, there isn't a legal description because it's, it's usually based on, on some natural parameters, what the soils would take, if there's a, if there's a stream flowing through it. So it's very, it's very natural boundaries, so there isn't an exact um, description of that, and for us to get where it is, it requires quite a bit of investigation, and right now, what the state is it says is that uh, they will they will work with us uh, or landowners to uh, 
to, to figure out where this is. Uh, but but they, they do it on a, on a they will, they will donate about an hour to two hours of their time towards, towards the research, and after that, uh, they're going to charge uh, for, for that time. Um, so, uh, so, but there are, there are several, several ways that, uh, that these sites get, get, get dealt with, but um, it, it's, it's very difficult for us to, to kind, of, kind of figure this out. And so, but but the, the landowner is, is in charge of all this. And so, uh, and when there is a site that is approved, it stays with the land. And the landowner can restrict access to the haulers. Uh, if the land is sold, uh, the approval goes with the new landowner. Uh, sites are considered active unless, unless they're told otherwise. But sometimes the landowners or the haulers don't notify the DNR, and so uh, their, their records may not always be accurate. Uh, so, uh, and if you want to remove a site from, from there, it takes it's only, only the landowner uh, or the hauler can remove a site. And there's no formal process. Uh, for them to, to remove the site and changes in ownership, uh, they don't always talk to the DNR. And so, uh, with that, we know that we know that they're out of those those numbers. That uh, that there's probably less uh, sites and less haulers because they're 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 not actively keeping track with the DNR. Uh, we talked about enforcement is citation and and, and complaint driven. Uh, the DNR does not have a policy to reevaluate approved sites based on new soils or new topographic data. Some of these sites were approved decades ago, uh, and, and they're, they're, in, they're in the state's archives in, in paper form, not electronic form. And so if we go to request some information, if it's, if it's in the a very old site, there's a lot of research that's required in order to figure out um, which site it is and what, what, was, uh, what was approved. So what we did is uh, we, we, we looked at uh, one, one town in Dunn County, Colfax, and there were 11 sites in Colfax that are registered to the state. We picked one of those sites and, and went to the state and said, would you help us just to understand uh, how, this, how this one site is, is done and, and where it's really at. And so the state said, yeah, they would work with this. They dedicated about 16 hours of their research time and to, to, to produce the map and all the data that went with that site. They gave it to us. Uh, we then took that, that information and, and we, we spent about 10 hours of time uh, confirming where it is, remapping it, uh, and then confirming it against what the state has. And what we found... Uh, <coughs> Is if I can get this to go over here now. Of course, it doesn't work right now. Uh, so this is this is this is the map of Colfax that, and this is our this is our environmentally sensitive um, areas map, and and the the, the bottom is the key. That you can see that you know that we have shoreland buffers, wetlands, uh, slopes greater than 12 to 20 percent, greater than 20 percent, uh, floodplain, flood fringe, and then water recharge. And then the areas that are in black are the areas that don't have any kind of environmentally sensitive factor applied to them. And then the little numbers on there, those are the 11 sites that that are in Colfax. And we selected we selected one of those, which is at almost on the western edge there. Uh, and so when <laughs> now I've lost it. Uh, I don't know what happened here. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to get it back now. Um, <laughs> So, so what we found is is this is this is the map that, that when this when the state gave us they spent uh, about 16 hours of their time and they gave us all the data that goes into this map and it was actually it was it was once it was two forties but there was actually three areas of uh, uh, sites that, that that they gave us that that are in there and so the, the areas in yellow are are the sites where you can spread on and so you can see they're very difficult to map 
Uh, we don't know how they follow those lines because they follow soils lines and, and, and there's a stream that goes in between there so there's a setback from a, from a stream on there as well. So what we did is, is we, we took their information just to check it to see how, what we would do and we came up with a map very similar to what the state came up with. I mean almost identical but still we don't know how a person finds those, those, those boundaries but that's that's the that's the process that's used right now. So, uh, so in the end, uh, what we're doing is 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 what we found is that number one is that uh, we can't we can't do anything more than what the state says that we can do. Uh, we did we did go to the haulers and ask them for information about their sites and and. We, we found that some of them would provide the information, but most of them wouldn't because it's not required by statute. So, so we, we couldn't map according to that, and so we moved on. We know that we can't, we can't do anything more than what the state requires. Uh, we, we, we do know that, that, that through all of this, we have a legislative agenda, and that, that the county has brought this information up to our legislators and have asked them to, to at least consider Bringing some more local control back to to the county, so that we could then we could then do some of this stuff. Until that changes or <coughs> something else happens, our committee has put this project on hold because there's just not really much we can do uh, given 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 the parameters with that. So uh, that's pretty much what what we have found out through our study. I do have a a, a, a handout of, of my presentation on the table over there, and I, I know there aren't enough, and so I'll also leave some business cards on there. On the presentation, on the handout, there are links to to NR113. If you want to read the standards of NR113, it's it's I I won't give the ending away because it's it's, it's riveting. Uh, but there's also the the uh, some stuff about the uh, the. the the, the application form, what it takes to apply for for, for septic scrim. So, so with that, I will I will take questions when we get to the panel discussion. And so, thank you very much for having me. Do we have one final speaker who's? I kind of asked him to uh, do the hard job of of summarizing and wrapping up and filling in the gaps and telling us all we need to know. That's Neil Cook, who um, has been um, kind of been out there for quite a while trying to get people to think about uh, septage spreading and the, the whole septage system as an issue, as a possible threat to our groundwater. So uh, let's, I'll just turn this over to Neil. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for uh, allowing us to uh, present this uh, forum. Uh, yes, land spreading waste is a health hazard. Septic waste, and, and uh, Lindsay really touched on this quite well, septic waste contains E. coli, viruses such as hepatitis A, Norwich-like viruses, rotavirus and enterovirus, pharmaceuticals, heavy metals from cosmetics and toxic organic chemicals from cleaners, toilet bowl cleaners, oil and optic brighteners and laundry, laundry effluent, and whatever, whatever else you dump into the septic system. I find it hard to believe that we still allow land spreading in the United States when we know what the consequences are. When the easy solution is to take it to a municipal wastewater treatment facility. Michigan, Florida, and some places in Iowa have already banned land spreading of septic waste. The DNR has an 11-page document called NR 113, and, and Bob Olson addressed uh, that one. It's quite involved, and it lays out all the requirements that you need to do before you can land spread. I uh, asked the DNR to send me a list of all the land spreading sites in Dunn County and in 2011 they sent me 400 sites 
and I used the recharge map, which is on the wall over here, and plotted the 400 sites in that map, and found 150 sites do not meet DNR standards for percolation. Percolation cannot be greater than six inches an hour, and 150 sites went beyond that. And uh, Ocado County uh, looked at 18 sites and found 10 sites that did not meet the NR 113 standards. Portage County uh, had quite a tassel with uh, the DNR in trying to find out where those sites are and uh, uh, they wanted to, uh, to plot those on a map. Think, think how many sites there would be across the state of Wisconsin that do not meet the DNR requirements of percolation. And if you have a house near one of these sites, you're running a health hazard. The land spreading of human waste managed by the DNR is badly broken. Now the county could take it over, but uh, if the county takes it over, uh, the requirements that uh, the county has to uh, do are so rigorous that it would take a full-time person to handle it. I have contacted all the state representatives, the governor and the EPA about the problems that exist uh, in Wisconsin and uh, they, uh, they write back nice letters. Uh, they did, the DNR has, uh, through phone calls, emails and letters, told me that they are working on the problem. Now, uh, I'd like to shift a little bit from the land spreading, but I want to stay with the septic systems. There is a major problem in uh, the Chippewa Valley with the septic systems we have. Nitrate comes from manure, fertilizer, and septic systems. Now, the septic systems are not a failed system. This is just a natural thing that it happens in the septic system. Urban sprawl around all the cities in the Chippewa Valley have resulted in septic systems become a major cause of increased nitrate in wells. High nitrates are associated with colorectal cancer, central nervous system and birth, and birth defects, and thyroid disease. So we, all, we usually think of nitrate as a, a baby problem with uh, when it gets to 10 or above uh, the blue syndrome problem and death. But uh, now we, uh, through new studies, have found out that nitrate does cause these other uh, thyroid and or rectal cancers. Most people are not aware of the high nitrate in their wells and in housing developments. With a well and a septic system on each lot, in two to ten years, you will be drinking your neighbor's septic drain field water. And uh, there's been a study done in Chippewa County uh, bearing this out. Uh, they took uh, 60 wells and analyze them for pesticides and septic systems. Uh, the, the nitrate from the humans, they, they used uh, artificial sweeteners and another uh, ingredient that does not, does not exist in groundwater and determined a number of wells were being contaminated from septic systems. Uh, the governor this year has proclaimed 2019 the year of clean drinking water. Uh, and I've contacted the governor and told him about the situation in the Chippewa Valley. Uh, most of the time uh, in Madison, uh, you hear of all the problems near Green Bay and uh, in the Sand Hills area in central Wisconsin and in other areas, uh, but you never hear any problems in the Chippewa Valley. So I told him that uh, we have major problems with our groundwater uh, in the Chippewa Valley and uh, he is going to put some money toward uh, having better drinking water, so I recommended two things the governor should look at. Uh, we need money to go out and sample wells in the housing developments to determine if there is high nitrate. Now, analyzing nitrate is a very cheap thing to, uh, to have analyzed, so uh, 
if, if we find that there's high nitrate in these urban developments, we now need to bring in municipal water, or if municipalities will not bring in water, we need to establish rural water systems. Now, rural water, you, you see that when you go west, and there are some rural water systems in Wisconsin, but uh, uh, great areas in, in the states west of here have major rural water systems. Uh, we certainly, uh, and, and unfortunately, people just aren't aware of what the situation is. So uh, the danger of drinking uh, uh, your neighbor's septic, uh, when Lindsay lay, uh, laid out all the things that are in, in the septic system, uh, uh, we need to do something about it. That's all I have. Okay. Well. If anybody needs a quick break, this would be a good time. We're going to assemble the panelists up here and we're going to continue uh, the conversation. One of the things, well, and maybe I can get Greg to join us up at the table. One of the purposes for our study group is to get a, get feedback from people about what do you think our study group should be studying? Should we continue looking at this as an issue? Are there other things that are more important if we continue uh, looking at this as an, an issue? What ideas do you have about uh, what uh, we should be doing as, our, as a study group and as our study group <laughs> makes recommendations to uh, this chapter of the League of Women Voters? So let me pause and uh, we'll get the, uh, the <coughs> speakers assembled up at the front table. This up for questions and, and discussion. And um, I guess I'll just take people with raised hands. Sure. Um, I have a question. In our rural area, we have a rural fire department where we have five or six towns to get together and uh, we charge our residents a certain per, um, amount and we get rural we get from the Menominee fire department we get the rural services is there something we could do with the county and maybe some of the towns to build a wastewater facility treatment and kind of form something like the rural fire department <laughs> I'm just using that as an example but where these septage haulers can bring the stuff. You know, I, I mean, is there a way to, I know there's grants out there, there, there are grants available to build wa wastewater facilities and get loans at lower rates. Because it sounds like the city of Menominee is pretty, you guys, are, well, you, you're, you're half capacity. You wouldn't be able to take, like I'm in the town of Red Cedar and we have a pretty big town. The town of Dunn brings theirs to Ellsworth. Does, does could, that make sense? Do you understand what yeah. I'm saying? Could people in the back hear the question? So, can, can you repeat the question? I will or try. Hmm? <laughs> I, I, I will. I'll try to repeat the question. Basically, the, uh, is it uh, possible, desirable, conceivable, fundable to establish uh, rural sewage treatment uh, plants, specifically? Uh, to be able to have the capacity to handle the the septage from people's septic tanks. Is that right? Yeah, just a, a number of towns, maybe the county and a certain amount of towns. Or yeah, every maybe town. the towns could do this, maybe the county could do it. Yeah. Um, since the, the largest facility in the county, the, the city's facility, is at capacity, at least with the solids. Anybody want to address that? Uh, I guess this is a How about now? Yeah. You know, that kind of reminds me of um, an initiative a couple of years back that occurred in southeast Wisconsin for manure di digesters for kind of a community manure digester for people who um, don't have manure storage or um, need somewhere to put it when the cat spread it in the wintertime. Um, so I certainly think it's a good idea, and uh, I don't know offhand of a funding source for that, but I think it's something that um, we should continue to talk about because I do think it's a great idea to 
um, band towns together um, or in multiple municipalities and, and try to come up with a, a working solution um, as, a, as a group. I do want to point out that uh, near Oshkosh, the, the township of Algoma is just on the west side of Oshkosh. And uh, the first thing the township did was to abandon their septic systems. And because the septic systems were contaminating their groundwater. And then uh, probably uh, 20 years later, uh, the well water became contaminated with arsenic. And the arsenic levels were quite high so the the township had a chance to go in with the city and i'm sure after a considerable dialogue the township decided to create their own well system and they got uh, bond monies and uh, and built water towers and water lines to all of the sub developments housing developments throughout their township and uh, they looked at all the options other than doing that, and they found this would be the most economical, long-term way to go. And uh, I have a brother that lives there, so I've been following all their progress, and I've been on the phone with the uh, with the water superintendent there, and they're very pleased with what's going on. And uh, if you had a house with a well before they did this, you could you could grandfather out of going in with the new water system. You could keep your well. And, but all new housing, all new industry had to tie in with the township water system. And uh, when you go to sell your house, you might want to be hooked into the township water system to get a good sale. I'd just like to, is this on? Yeah. I'd just like to add, I, I, I would like to see something like that. A sewerage district or you live in this area, your waste goes to this treatment plant and so forth that would help us plan. Um, the city wastewater plant, we, we look at future growth and what areas we may take in in the future, you know, maybe Cedar Falls, maybe Woodland Terrace will eventually be piped in. So those are potential growth areas. But the hauled waste, we, we take what we can, but there is nothing preventing waste from Eau Claire or anywhere else coming in. I would like to see something, something like that. How do we go about it? <laughs> Well, how do we go about that? Is that something that uh, this environmental study group sh should be investigating? I mean, it's a state, state matter myself. I could, I'd like to make a comment. Uh, I don't think it's any secret that for the last eight years in the state of Wisconsin, we have had a governor that is against the DNR. That's a fact. And so I heard some heard some comments here that, this evening that are sort of putting giving the DNR a black eye. That DN, that black eye belongs on the former governor and the legislature. They have pulled the teeth of the DNR. They made the DNR very weak. And so it's kind of like the finger is being pointed at the DNR here somewhat this evening, but that point, that finger goes higher up and it goes to the state. And when I hear comments like things are self-regulated, I mean, come on, that's 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 the uh, giving the fox the the keys to the hen house. And so these things. Hopefully this new administration is going to put some teeth back in to make this stronger. And we see deregulation throughout this nation going on. And now we've got it, you know, I didn't come here this evening expecting to have this reaction that I'm having now. But it's really sad. You know, we're talking about a septic tank and what it's doing to our health. Mr. Cook mentioned that. What is it doing to our health? And we shouldn't have to worry about things like that. And so I'm not look, I'm not posing a question, I'm just making a comment. And I'm I'm gonna you know, walk out of here this evening a little bit angrier than when I walked in. Yeah, I would like to add in uh, 
in 2011 when I first started looking at this, uh, one person handled 17 counties in the Dunn County area. Uh, today, one person from the DNR is handling the entire state. Now, it's not DNR's fault. It's just the, uh, uh, the way they're handling their personnel. And uh, so, so that becomes a major problem. Point well made. I think it was part of my discussion that, that, that you were referencing, and by, by no means was, was I pointing a finger at the state. No, no. The, uh, the, the DNR, uh, you're right, the DNR has, has, been, has been cut off at the knees. And, uh, but but the, 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 the point at the end of my discussion is, is that the local control has been taken away, but, but at least we are having conversations with our legislators to see if they couldn't bring back local control. Give us some more control back so we could do things locally. So, uh, Question way in the back. I've got a couple comments to make. I'm from Western Chippewa County, and the Chippewa County groundwater study was referenced before. Um, and we've had three groundwater surveys. The first one was in the late 80s, second one was 2007, and the third was in 2016. So the last two were nine <coughs> years apart, and the first two were more than 18 years apart. I believe it was 20 some years. And the night. Nitrates in the wells have, the number of wells with 10 parts per million has more than, the rate is the same between the two study periods. The first period being the late 80s to 2007, the second period from 2007 to 16, the rate of increase, the number of wells over 10 parts per million is the same in less than half the time. So the problem is accelerating, is my point. Um, I have been told by somebody off the Land Conservation Committee that all east they have septic systems that will uh, release water that's 99.9% .9 pure compared to the afternoon that we're putting in mound systems. And my contention is mound systems are a big part of the problem because this water is discharged too deep into the soil layer, everything goes down, so it's groundwater. It needs to be on top where plants can use the nutrients and use it in the nutrient cycle. But until local groups and counties start banging on legislative doors in, in Madison and demanding that something be done, nothing's going to change. And the other thing, other observation I make, which a lot of people probably don't like, is it, what happened in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. There were a lot of systems that discharged above the ground, albeit in bad places probably, in road ditches, but that didn't go into groundwater. The state came along and said, now you put in mounds, and now it's down how many inches below the root zone of most grasses? Where's it going? Why are we seeing nitrates go up? It's kind of a no-brainer in my opinion. But if this, this problem's kind of been solved is what I've been told out east. I don't know. I haven't done any research on it. But that would be something for your group to look at is what are they doing out east? What are other systems out here? It's not like, and it's not like landowners or homeowners aren't paying for what they're, for a system that works. I mean, mounds aren't cheap. If you put that money into something that actually works, we'd all be better off and it actually get something for our money. What was the question? What was the question? Was there a comment? Yeah. Uh, Barry. Well, one of the questions that I would ask the group here and ask those of you speaking is, should the League of Women Voters really be advocating for local control so that the local um, counties, whether it's Chippewa or, or, or Dunn, can actually supersede or, or make different regulations than the state, so make them more restricted? And, and you, Bob, uh, said that they're, you're, trying, you're trying to advocate for that. Would that be something that the uh, that you would encourage the league to do, and uh, and then the idea of the uh, looking at other options that are being done in other parts of the country might be something to look at. Anyway, just uh, so if if I could comment on that. Yes. Uh, thank you, Marty. Uh, as a zoning administrator, uh, we get a lot of questions about you know what's going on and, and why can't we do something about it and and. 
And septage isn't the only area where, where we have been limited in terms of local control. We were also, we were also been handcuffed in terms of our, our shoreland ordinances. And so local control has, has been systematically been removed or being taken away. And so, but the county does have a legislative agenda. Uh, and, and so on an annual basis, we do get together uh, with, with some ideas and we do, we just had a, uh, a, 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 a listening session just Monday with the legislators in, in, in presenting five, six of the, of the, of the key topics that we, that we wanted them to speak on. There's many other ones, but we do have a legislative agenda where, where the county is advocating to, for, to, to bring local control. And local control for us is, is county control uh, of, of regulations. We think that, 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 yes, it does, it would take more, more resources, but we think that locally that we have a better handle on what's happening with, with, with these things and that we could maybe apply some standards above and beyond what the state is doing. So I, I would think that if the, the, that would be a, a, a good platform for the league to say, bring back some local control. Well, let's consider. I would like to know if we have any um, landowners here that um, have had the application of human waste um, applied on their land. And if so, how that has maybe affected their land or if they've had their personal wells tested. Do we have any local landowners here that have had human waste applied? Nobody? <laughs> well, I think that years and years ago when I was a kid growing up on a farm. Pardon me? I said years and years ago when I was a kid growing up on a farm in uh, near Colfax, all of the farmers, any of the septic tanks that they had there, that was spread directly on their own land. So that has been done, but I think there's, you know, you can't do that now. I don't believe you can do that now. Yeah, I would say the uh, NR-113, if uh, they go out and pump at a farm, their septic, that can be spread on their farm. Incorrect. So there's no, it, it you, may not be a site, but it can be spread on that farm. That's not correct. You have to have DNR approval to spread on any field. Doesn't matter if it's your own land, your own farm. It has to be DNR approved land before land applying any septage waste. Okay. Come in here. Uh, I was wondering how the fields uh, that are being used uh, to dump septage um, can be monitored. I'm just thinking of my own place. I have a, um, a field that I rent to a neighbor uh, and uh, he uses it for cash crops. That field is a long ways away from my house. And I don't understand how testing could be, should um, somehow that field be used for septage. I don't understand how it could be tested if you have to go down 125 feet to touch the groundwater, tested for nitrates. How is that done? Is it done? On the, are all of those fields close enough to a house that they can take? I, can, I have had my water from my house tested. I just get a little bottle and, and send the water off and have it tested. But how are those fields tested? How would they know if they're separated from a barn or someplace where they could, uh, there would be a, uh, a well. I'm not an expert on NR-113. Uh, it, it, that would be someone from the state. But I, but it, in the map that I showed you before of the areas, you know, when we mapped uh, the area, uh, compared it against the site that the state had, I didn't, I didn't point out, but at the, at the bottom of that map, there was a home there and with a well. And I, I believe that, that there's a ring around that well, maybe 250 or 400, but there's a distance from that well that they also have to stay away from for, for spreading. Uh, but that, 
that was part of the of the boundary of where they could spread. So there there is there are some standards in terms of of, of soils, distances to wells, setbacks from 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 open water, from and, and certain soil types that, that that allows them to say this can be spread on, this can't be spread on. But but I'm not an expert on NR113, but but all those standards are in in there and. Uh, someone from the state certainly would be able to answer those questions more eloquently than, than I have. Yeah. But uh, groundwater, as I understand it, doesn't just sit under one place. It's flowing. So if it's flowing, uh, what if it's flowing toward the well? <laughs> right. Then it's going to become, going to contaminate that well. Sure. Uh, there's been studies in Wisconsin and throughout the nation uh, showing that uh, uh, the viruses can travel great distances and stay alive for a considerable length of time. So uh, this now becomes a greater concern as we uh, land spread our human waste. Um, can we access a map for uh, where the dumping grounds are in Dunn County? That's the study that we were trying to do, uh, and and as I explained, it will show you it will show you the, the forty where they're at, but it won't you won't get down to the actual to the actual site. And I did a calculation, you know, if if we did because if there are four hundred ninety three actual sites in Dunn County, mm -hmm. and uh, <coughs> and with the with the study that we did the state provided 16 hours of time and we we provided 10 hours of time so if we just said that there was it took us it took the county we took that over and and said we're going to map each one of those sites and we said oh, let's say 16 hours it would take us to do that one person working 40 hours a week it would take them almost four years to map all of those sites in the county to do the research and to get them mapped so it's it's a large undertaking not that it couldn't be done, but, but so we do that, but what can we do with the map? We can't do anything more than just know where they are right now. So let me... Uh, well, I would like to know where they are if they're near me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well... Would you advise her to what, contact the DNR? Yes, I, I think that'd be the best is, is mm -hmm. to just contact the state and, and find out, give them your location and, and have them provide you with the with the location where, where, where they where they are in and around you. Uh, and there again, it will be on the 40s or 80s. It won't be a specific site. So, um, I, I'm aware of the clock, and I don't want to keep people here past eight o'clock. Um, and so maybe we. There's several hands to love, and and uh, Greg is telling me there's somebody in the back whose hand I haven't even seen. So well, let's let's take that one and. <coughs> Who is that? Oh, is that Kathy Stall? Yeah. Yeah. Several questions. You know, are they perhaps the where do I want to? One of the questions is, DNR is still uh, licensing new sites, or do you know they are, and do we get can we use that information at least start from this point on to get that information about where the sites are specific, you know, that are newly licensed, since you don't have to go through 16 hours to get that information. The other thing is, is there any value? There have been some wonderful suggestions about things that we should be doing, but as a stopgap, could the League of Women Voters and I don't know if you get that information to find out where our haulers are taking the septage and who are going to to uh, uh, the wastewater treatment and, and give them uh, awards for being green haulers. You know, let's give them awards for people who are handling the septage appropriately and actually getting it treated. Because I don't think people know. You don't know that at least when it leaves my house, I don't know where it's going. And is, can we research, get that information, and get that out publicly and give people awards for doing it? As a stopgap while we're looking at local control when we're doing these studies. That's a nice idea. I'll, we'll take two, Ellen, and then and then Dick, and, and I guess if we don't go on too long, we'll take the third one. And then we'll 
Get out of here. I'll, I'll be brief, okay? <laughs> if you want to know where your septage hauler takes the septage from your septic system, ask them. Yeah. You, you had a list, Paul had, Paul had a list, I think, of septage haulers that bring septage. In 2018. In That's 2018, what right. right. Right, and I noticed that, that my hauler was on your list, but I have talked to them and they do say that they bring it to the solid waste treatment plant. Do they charge you more than when they do that? Yeah. <coughs> I don't remember, I'm we sorry. Have to. It seems like they did, they told it's, me they it's would. It's possible. <coughs> Another thing, we have a septage hauler that lives near us, and he owns land right across the road from us, 550 feet from our house, and he has spread it there. Not just lately, but our previous dog thought it was great to go over and roll in it. <laughs> <laughs> So one is you said there's 35 haulers in Dutton County. Is that public information that we could get or find out who helped you, who gave you information that told us where they were spreading and which ones told you to go take a hike? It is public information because we, you know, I don't know that it's accurate though, Dick, uh, because as I said, they you can they pull them. Yeah. According to their records, there are 35 that are that are, that are licensed in the <coughs> How many are still active? I don't know. Okay. And one for Neil quickly, arsenic. Wasn't that banned in the use of arsenic banned in Europe 25, 30 years ago? Yeah. The arsenic was banned in the The arsenic? Yes. Okay. So that's another thing we could go after. Why are we using it in the United States, period? And the third thing, I just make a comment. If this is an outstanding uh, community involvement tonight and as you said the PRD meeting is every two weeks Tuesday morning 8:30 if we could have some share of these number of people attend those meetings and find out what's happening would be a big step forward for Dunn County. Okay one more I, I would I think we're kind of missing the boat though we're concentrating on septic okay when my tank is pumped, it's about 3,500 gallons, but it's pumped once every three years. What about all the rest that's going out to that mound system, like the other gentleman said, and it's being put in the ground below the red zone? If you're going to solve your well problems with your nitrates, which is water soluble, means it attaches to water, it goes out with the water, the vast majority of it is going out to your drain field and percolating into your ground. I know most of Dunn County is very sandy soil, percolates very fast. So even if you do have a deep rooted crop on top of that mound system or drain field, the chances of getting it captured by a crop is slim. If you're going to look at protecting your groundwater, you got to deal with 100% of the stuff leaving your house, not just the septage. The biggest problem you're going to have with your wells is right in your backyard. It's your drain field or your mound system or what you have. It's not the septage that's being spread because that's getting on top of the ground where plants, crops, and etc. can get a hold of the nutrients and use it. The vast majority of it, like I said, is below the root zone going to the groundwater. Just a comment on that. Uh, in a housing development where you have a septic and a well, uh, every acre or less, 60% of the recharge to the aquifer in that area comes from the drain field of your septic system. That's a lot. And I would add one more thing. In Wood County, all the haulers got together and are taking their wastewater to a municipality. Mr. Bolin, do uh, you want to? Yes, I have, a, I have a suggestion. You asked for comments about what you as a committee may do. Well, I think an, an excellent thing you could be doing is, is just looking at, taking a hard, tough look at NR 113. There's, there's another statute in the state that allows any three citizens to get together and ask for a revision of, 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 any, of any statute or, uh, or administrative rule. So why not take a good hard look at 
Neil, or, uh, Mr. Colson mentioned some some diameter around a well uh, in which you can't spread septage. Uh, that, that's something that somebody ought to study. Is this still appropriate? Uh, and many other things might be in that that administrative rule as well that you as a committee could look at. Thank you. Uh, let me try to wrap up here. I, I'm still thinking that for, oh, we got these system problems and it's complex and every time we we were kind of zeroing in on oh this might be a solution somebody else brought up yes but you're forgetting about this aspect of it and you know we all have to go to the bathroom it's all got to go somewhere um, but I think it's going to be a real challenge for us and for the next couple generations maybe to figure out where that stuff ought to be going and how it ought to be handled, but I, I think I'm hearing from everybody uh, that what we're doing right now probably isn't very good for our groundwater. Do you want to say anything? <laughs> our, our chairman of our committee is, is a very sharp guy. Yeah, him full. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming and um Here, you want to... no i don't need the mic but... <laughs> you gotta stand up and shout yeah, stand up. i have to get up and shout okay thanks thank you everybody for coming um it has been a very uh, awakening experience for me and the group to uh, study septage spreading as well as you know where we go from here uh, do we test the wells before and after the sites? Um, you know, we just we were looking for directions from the public. Um, so if you guys, uh, you know, uh, care to comment, you know, on that, I'd appreciate that. Um, and then looking into NR 113 was a really good thing. It's probably not up in my alley. I'm not a legal guy. Uh, my wife is. I'm not the guy. Yeah, one of the things that I, I, I really enjoy is looking after the environment, um, trying to find ways to better improve people's lives. And you know, like uh, the septic companies that spread, they are doing everything uh, legal that we know of. Um, the county is doing everything that they can, and it's in the uh, Everybody hit the nail on the head with the uh, governor taking away the powers of the DNR, um, and we would like that to, to change. Um, so maybe what we'll do is probably just uh, kind of keep on plugging away at this and maybe advocate uh, NR-113, changing uh, the rules. And you're all invited to join yeah. our group? Yes. Greg and I like to meet at places that have good beer, if that's interesting to any of you, but it's not a requirement, of course. But it's after 8 o'clock, so I would like to thank. Can I say one thing? To look at them. Yeah. And the League of Women Voters has a website. It's um, LWG. Help me. G C S C. Thank you. Yeah, it's right. Oh, it's right there on the flyer. So right there, and um, the all the meetings for the study groups are listed there. So it, you can just look up and find out when the next uh, environmental group meeting is. It's usually in the afternoon and show up. We have one more announcement. Um, I just want. Yeah, if, if anyone. Um, Assembly District 67 Assembly Representative Rob Summerfield is going to be having a listening session at the Town of Red Cedar Town Hall on Monday, March 25th, from 1 to 2 p.m. If anyone would want to come, and maybe that would be an opportunity to discuss this with him or to bring up your concerns to him. He he's been named to the state groundwater task force yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that would be a great opportunity for people to come. And for John, for uh, the state having the forum, uh, the candidate candidate forum for the school board in Menominee. So if you 
Thursday, March 7th. Yep. <laughs>